Born on December 16, 1485, to King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabel I of a newly united Spain, Catherine of Aragon's formative years were spent on the move following the Spanish army during the Christian Reconquista, until it finally ended with the War of Granada. It was Queen Isabel's decision to bring all of her children along, the main reason being she wanted to make sure they all, especially her daughters, had a proper education which Isabella herself was not afforded. This resulted in Catherine being fluent in both Greek and Latin, the latter of which at the time was mostly reserved to be taught to boys, as it was the language of politics in the majority of Europe. She was also knowledgeable in a wide range of topics, such as philosophy, law, and history. Her mother's reasoning was that the better educated her daughters were, the better they could influence their future husbands to benefit Spain. Catherine, like her mother, was a religious fanatic, something which would later play heavily into her own daughter's life. Though the final Moor Kingdom fell in 1492, Catherine's family would continue to travel for another eight years, continuing to expand and solidify Spain's control over the Iberian Peninsula. After solidifying their power, Spain and France began to feud over control of Italy. This led Ferdinand and Isabella to begin an effort to politically isolate France through the formation of political allies in Europe. Of course, the easiest way to accomplish this was through the marriage of their four daughters. The oldest, Isabella, would marry Prince Alfonso of Portugal. Their second daughter, Joanna, would marry Philip of Flanders. Their third daughter, Maria, would marry Isabella's second husband, Manuel I of Portugal, after her sister's early death in 1498. And finally, their youngest daughter, Catherine, was to marry Arthur, Prince of Wales and heir to the English throne. To King Henry VII, a marriage with a powerful royal house was desperately needed to make his own House of Tudor legitimate in the eyes of many other European monarchs. So when the opportunity arose to have his oldest son Arthur marry a princess from the House of Tratismata, which was one of the most powerful houses at the time, he accepted, and in 1489, the Treaty of Medina del Campo was formed between the two. This treaty came with many political stipulations dealing with France, such as coming to the aid of the other if a war with France occurred, and inclusion of the other in any political or trade talks they have with France. As for what the treaty said about Catherine and Arthur, who were only four and three years old respectively at the time, it stated that they would marry as soon as they were both of age, which was decided to be when Arthur turned 13, and so the two were married by proxy on May 19th, 1499, though it wouldn't be until 1501 when the two would finally meet in person. There were multiple reasons that the two were kept apart, the main one being Ferdinand holding back on sending his daughter due to the security of the English throne coming under threat by a man named Perkin Warbeck. Warbeck claimed to be Richard of Shrewsbury, the second son of Edward IV, and more famously known as one of the princes in the tower, a claim that if true would mean that Perkin would have had a much more legitimate claim to the throne than Henry VII. Sometime during this debacle, Henry VII sent a letter to Ferdinand II asking if they were ever going to actually send the princess. Ferdinand, with knowledge of the ongoing threat to Henry's power, simply stated that he wished to wait until Arthur turned 14. However, this is a deadline which would come to pass by another year. While they waited to meet, Catherine and Arthur had begun to communicate in letters written in Latin, the only common language between the two. Only one such letter has survived, and it is from Arthur, written on the 5th of October, 1499. I will link it in the description below, and I highly encourage you to find some time to at least skim through it, because even though it's mostly thought that Arthur alone didn't write the letter, it's still really cute in a political marriage kind of way. Then, after years of waiting, with Warbeck disposed and Arthur's 15th birthday fast approaching, in September of 1501, Catherine, an entourage consisting of her governess, her governess's husband, various Spanish political and religious officials, and an amount of African attendants, all set sail for England from Acurna, finally landing in Plymouth in early October. From there, the group slowly began to move toward London. So slowly, in fact, that King Henry decided to travel with Arthur to meet them in Hampshire, where, against her own father's wishes, Catherine finally met with their future husband and father-in-law. It was here 
where the young couple realized that the extreme differences in the way they spoke Latin made verbal communication impractical. The two groups would then proceed to London together, where, on the 14th of November, 1501, Catherine and Arthur were married in St. Paul's Cathedral. Together, the newlyweds traveled to Wales in December in order for Arthur to continue his duties as Prince of Wales. It is often stated that the two were indeed a love match, but whether this is true or not, their life together didn't last long, as by April of 1502, Arthur was dead. Arthur's sudden death left Catherine in a strange limbo. Though her mother desperately wanted for her to return home, her father was not one to back out of a deal, especially when it can mean gaining an ally against France. And so he refused to allow her to return, feeling that if she were to stay in England, then eventually a marriage match would be found. King Henry VII also had much to lose if Catherine were to return, as he would have to give back her dowry, which at the time had only been half paid, and so Catherine was, at the age of 16, trapped as a foreign princess in a foreign land. Life for Catherine during this period was not easy. For a while, she lived in a strange limbo, supported financially by King Henry VII, until it was finally decided that she would marry Henry's second son and new heir to the throne, Henry VIII. This had an issue in itself due to the legality of Prince Henry marrying his brother's widow, with the main issue being whether or whether not the marriage was consummated. To which Catherine claimed it was not, and eventually the Pope would give his permission for them to marry, but it was during this time following Arthur's death, but before her eventual remarriage, when Catherine would face one of her first great struggles. It began when her mother-in-law, Elizabeth of York, who was the daughter of Edward IV, passed away in 1503, an event that would deeply emotionally pain Catherine's father-in-law, and soon after, he would once again fear over his legitimacy. Then, the following year, another, much greater tragedy struck. Catherine's own mother died, with her older sister, Juana, inheriting Castile, meaning that Catherine herself was no longer a possible heir of Castile which was the more powerful of her parents' claims in Spain, essentially making Catherine worth much less than before. And so began the beginning of her horrid treatment. She was kept in the Durham house in London like a prisoner. Her financial support from the King Henry dwindled, leading her to slowly sell off her possessions she had brought with her from Spain in order to fund herself and her ladies-in-waiting. Multiple times in this period, she sent complaints to her father, practically begging him to either send the rest of her dowry so she could marry, or to allow her to return home. She was very rarely allowed to meet with her future husband or spend time at court. This isolation led her to further her religious veneration to such an extent that King Henry had to write to the Pope, asking that he give Prince Henry the ability to tell Catherine to stop, from fear that her fasting practices would inhibit her ability to have children. Up to this point, countless ambassadors from Spain had attempted to convince King Henry to go through with the marriage contract, all of which had failed, leaving Catherine living in her poor conditions. These conditions would begin to change, though, as in 1507, Catherine herself became an ambassador, one of the first women ambassadors in Europe, at which she fared well, using the king's own desires to attempt to sway him to allow her marriage. Her efforts were in vain, though, as her father still held out on sending the final half of her dowry. It would take King Henry VII's death in April of 1509 for the two to finally be married. This wedding would take place on the 11th of June at the Palace of Placentia. Then, on the 24th of June, they were crowned together as King and Queen of England. And just like her last marriage, it seemingly began to be a love match. The two could often be seen dancing and laughing with one another. Catherine was soon pregnant, and during this pregnancy, Henry doted on her heavily. But in January of 1510, she suffered her first miscarriage. She became pregnant again in April of the same year, and would give birth to a baby boy on the 1st of January, 1511, who would be named Henry. An extravagant celebration ensued, but this joy was short-lived, as Prince Henry would die in late February from an unknown cause. It is stated during this time that Henry VIII made much effort to comfort his wife. The following years would be filled with wars, 
with Henry heading to France and Henry's brother-in-law, the Scottish King, James IV, leading an attack against England while Henry was absent. Catherine herself, in 1513, while once again pregnant, went to give a speech to the troops she had called upon to fight against these Scottish invaders. These troops would be successful. Her pregnancy, on the other hand, would not be. A few days after Catherine gave this speech, she would give birth to another son, who would unfortunately be stillborn. Soon after this, Catherine's aging father would go behind her husband's back and sign a peace treaty with France. Henry's anger for this action would fall on Catherine, but this anger quickly turned to grief, as in late 1514, she would once again give birth to a stillborn son. It was in this time when Catherine began to lose influence over Henry VIII to Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. The next spring of 1515, she would once again become pregnant, giving birth to a girl, February of 1516. This daughter would survive. She would be doted on heavily by her mother, who would make sure she was properly educated. And just like her mother, she would grow to be extremely tied to religion. This girl was, of course, Mary. But by the time of this daughter's birth, by the time Catherine had even become pregnant, Henry had already begun to have affairs, the first notable one being with Elizabeth Blount, beginning in either 1514 or 1515, and it would last for a number of years. Due to the amount of gossip that went on at the Tudor court, it is likely that Catherine knew about this affair from very early on, but she would never speak on it. That being said, the birth of a healthy baby girl somewhat restored Henry's faith in Catherine being able to have children. Though she was not a boy, Henry still saw her as useful, in the same way Catherine's own father had found her useful. And, at the same time, agreed to make her his official heir apparent in the case that Catherine has no son. Soon, Catherine was pregnant again, which would end in the birth of another stillborn daughter in 1518. This would be the last child Catherine would ever have. In the following year of 1519, Henry's first illegitimate child, and the only one he ever acknowledged, would be born to Elizabeth Blount, a son, Henry Fitzroy. This, in Henry's mind, proved that Catherine's lack of a son was not his fault. And in 1522, a six-year-old Princess Mary would be betrothed to Catherine's 22-year-old nephew, Charles V, who Catherine was and would remain very close to throughout her life. This would fail, though, with Charles instead marrying his and Catherine's mutual cousin, Isabella of Portugal. Due to this failure and her inability to have a son, Catherine was publicly humiliated. Following this blow, Henry would give his son, Henry Fitzroy, the titles of Duke of Richmond and Somerset. Henry would have at this time began his next affair with Mary Boleyn sometime after 1520. It is highly theorized that both of her children were in fact his. He would then begin the first of his most famous affairs, this being the affair with Anne Boleyn, with Catherine learning of it sometime around early 1526. Of course, as with the earlier affairs, Catherine did not see her as a serious threat. But soon after the beginning of this new affair, Anne would begin to make Henry question his marriage's legitimacy. He wanted to go to Pope Clement to ask about the legitimacy of his marriage, but due to Charles V sacking Rome, Pope Clement was currently Charles's prisoner. So Henry decided to come to the conclusion on his own choosing that Leviticus said that their marriage was illegal due to the consummation of Anne and Arthur's marriage. And in June of 1527, he told Catherine his conclusion, and that their marriage was invalid, and that they had been living in sin for 18 years. To which the ever-pious Catherine broke down, crying that her marriage with Arthur was, in fact, never consummated. With difficulty, he got word to Pope Clement, who, due to his current situation, denied Henry's request for annulment. So, Henry instead turned to Thomas Wolsey, the Lord Chancellor and Cardinal Archbishop of York, to get Pope Clement to ask for annulment. Wolsey asked three times, and was told no all three. He returned to England a failure. Henry meant to execute him, but on his way to London, he passed instead from natural causes. 
At this point, Henry attempted to save himself the trouble and asked Catherine if she would please retire to a nunnery, to which she denied, and is often quoted at this point of saying, God never called me to a nunnery. I am the king's true and legitimate wife. And so they went to court against each other in front of Pope Clement, who would once again side with Catherine. Now, the actual divorce of Catherine and Henry is quite complicated. So here is an extremely simplified version. In 1531, Catherine was banished from English court and barred from seeing her daughter, who would remain under Henry's care. The two would never meet again. Then, the Archbishop of Canterbury died in August of 1532, so Henry appoints Thomas Cranmer, who had ties to the Boleyn family to be his successor. Following this, Henry and Anne marry in secret in the winter of 1532. Then, they have a public marriage in January of 1533. Following this, in May of the same year, Cranmer is the judge on the special court that was created in order to decide the legality of Henry and Catherine's marriage, which she says was in fact unlawful. So, a devastated Catherine leaves. Though now officially she's the Dowager Princess of Wales, she never stops referring to herself as the Queen, signing off letters as such. Another blow was given when Anne and Henry's daughter, Elizabeth, was named as Henry's heir under the Succession Act of 1533 to which Catherine would write in secret to her own daughter, consoling her at the loss of her title as princess, that this is just God testing her and telling her not to take a husband that will lead her from God. Catherine would be moved from palace to palace over the next few years, before finally ending up in Kimbolton Castle, which would be the place of her death. She would die in January of 1536, and at the time, it was highly suspected that she was poisoned due to her heart being black and lumpy, something which is now interpreted as having been cancer. Her tomb can still be visited today inside the Peterborough Cathedral. Now, there are quite a few things I skipped over for the sake of flow and brevity, but here are some things about Catherine that I would like to highlight. Catherine was very intelligent and strong-willed. She had spent her whole childhood being educated on political matters to prepare her for her marriage. Catherine was also a big supporter of the arts, and most importantly, she was a huge believer in women's education, commissioning a book, The Education of a Christian Woman, in order to educate her daughter Mary. This sparked many to educate their own daughters. Catherine, in a sense, made education for women fashionable. Catherine herself never recognized her divorce, neither did her daughter, who, when she became queen 13 years after the death of her mother, declared that her mother's marriage was in fact lawful and commissioned several paintings in her memory. 